do you know what I think today? A lot of people are watching from the motorcycling world that know Steve, that have worked with Steve, that hang around with Steve, and they're probably thinking, please don't tell that story about us. Am I right? I know, I am. This guy, Steve Parrish, if you don't know him, it, former motorcycle racer, top level, Barry Sheen's teammate back in the day, European truck champion, five times. I think he's won it more than anybody else, actually. But mainly practical joker. In fact, so much so that he got done once on Beatles About. Do you remember Beatles About? We watched it last night, didn't we? We did, yeah, it was quite funny. It was quite funny. I can't believe how much hair Steve had. Marissa Deborah, good morning. Derek McAndrew, good morning to you. Rue 36, hello. Mark 2841, good morning. Pe Cammy Pe Wolfie, Mr. Marwood, not MotoGP Jules. People Steve's are asking Facebook. already, have you read the book? I have read the book. Oh, yes, I have read the book. It, um, it's very good. It's very funny. Um, you should also read the book that he wrote with Nick Harris on Barry Sheen, which is very funny and also very heartbreaking. So read that one as well as. Alrighty, are we ready for Steve Parrish? Are we ever ready for Steve Parrish? I don't think we are. Yep, uh, Jay Cook said he's just finished Steve's book and it was great. Graham Patterson, hello, views from the Man Cave. Good morning, so good morning, morning. to you, Geordie Lodge. Morning, morning, views from the Man Cave, and he is live. Righty. Good morning, Susie. Good morning, Stephen, how are you? I'm extremely well, thank you very much indeed. I'm thinking to relocate outside, actually, as you are. I'm sat in my kitchen having been to the gym this morning, had my breakfast, got my coffee machine beside me, but it's uh, such a gorgeous day here in the UK as well. Ah, uh, well, then you should be outside because you live in a beautiful place, a beautiful part of the world, and I know this because we used to take off from your garden and fly to different races in your farm. <laughs> We certainly did. In fact, if you like, I'll, um, I'll walk out to the International Departures Gate, uh, which is here um, outside. Hey, and so this is Steve. Steve, stop, stop, stop. As you're walking yeah. out, can you just point out the memorabilia you've got on your um, walls and things and give us a little tour? Oh, right. Yeah, of course I can. I'll, um, I'll come you. back in here. Right. So this is in the kitchen. Um, and we've got truck, so you mentioned truck racing, a bit of truck racing there. Lots of friends up here. Uh, the book that you mentioned on Barry that Nick and I wrote, uh, that was actually called Barry. Um, me riding Valentino Rossi's bike, which you were there at the time, which was great mm -hmm. fun. Me riding Kevin Schwantz's bike at Goodwood. Oh, do you know what? I had a, I had yeah. a dream last night that I was with Kevin Schwantz. And I was trying really? to get into the American Grand Prix. Yeah, not weirdly. Um, and they wouldn't let him in. And I was trying to get him a pass. It was absolutely bizarre. Anyway, carry on. Okay, all right. Well, um, I'm sure he would have got you a pass. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, truck racing, bits and pieces. Me tearing around following Mr. Sheen. Uh, my last race at Macau was there. Um, again, oh, can, there's I lots of stop, can I just stop you on that? Your last yeah. race at Macau. Is that, mm. Did you have to stop racing there because you actually got thrown out of the country and you're banned from going back in? There was an issue, I agree. Um, yeah, there was a little issue where uh, a firework went off and I, as always, got the blame. And yes, I had to go to prison in Macau for a few days because <laughs> we, we um, blew up a place at a red light. It was a brothel, I think it was. Um, anyway, <laughs> it went off, this firework went off. And... Um, where it all went wrong, the chief of police was in there. That's what went wrong, because if he hadn't <laughs> have been in there, we wouldn't have got caught. And I want to know what he was doing in there. We often thought he was having a backhander, but it might have been a fronthander, whatever he was happening. But So anyway, yes, I did get that. So that was Macau, my last race. And, uh, you know, I have been back, though, because back then it was owned by the Portuguese, and now it's gone back to China. So I have been back since, but I did have a five-year ban, yeah. Not often you get banned from a country, is it? No. no, well, not not normal people, really. But then again, you know, mm. you aren't normal. Mm. So um, no. feel free well, to anyway, carry on with your talk. Well, that's right. We're just wandering down the wall here. Lots of cartoons. You all remember John Mockett, I'm sure. Uh, John Mockett yeah. used to do all the cartoons for MCN, and I was the sort of victim of quite a few of those over the years. Uh, me with the Duke of Edinburgh there up in uh, Scarborough. 
um, doing uh, that. That all went a bit wrong with the Duke of Edinburgh, actually, because I put a remote controlled um, fart machine underneath the bike that when he went to shake hands with Phil Reed, <laughs> the fart machine went off. And it was quite funny because both his bodyguards stepped away. I think they actually thought he'd done one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, that was slightly embarrassing as well. Anyway, a um, few crash helmets around. And now here, the ponchos. Do you know anything about my ponchos? I don't know if I do know about your ponchos. All uh, right, well, can you see the poncho there? Hang on a minute, I might get the prop to hold it out. Uh, do you know, you know when you sometimes make a few business mistakes? Well, I ordered uh, a few ponchos. Can you see them there? Not me. Hang on, sorry, there we are. Can you see them there now? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are they not the dogs? I mean, they are absolutely brilliant, aren't they? But anyway, back oh, to the Michelle. story on the... Oh, she, she's been doing her Joe Wicks. Anyway. Oh, um, she? Yeah, she's been doing her Joe Wicks this morning. There she is already, and uh, with her muscles <laughs> out. Um, but anyway, the ponchos, I used to walk around in one. Someone gave me this poncho, and everyone said, where do you get them from? Where do you get them from? And I said, I don't know, I don't know. So I got Michelle on the job and we managed to source these ponchos. Um, and I said, right, get 100 because everyone I know wants a poncho. But um, with a minimum order was 10,000. So I've actually still got 9,992 <laughs> if you're in need of one. We use, right. them as PP we use them as PPE here, actually. Yeah. yeah, That would keep social distancing if you walk around in one of those, wouldn't it? Mm. Well, so if anybody would like to have one of those, they can message us today and I'll just forward the details to you and you can sort it out. Is that all right? Absolutely perfect. Yeah, they're, they're very sturdy. Uh, they're on my website, steveparishracing.com. But anyway, so there's a bit of the memorabilia, but I was just going to give you a quick run outside to um, Plummet Airways. There you go. You remember yeah. that? International departures. Well, I, I mean, I worked for them. Obviously, I was the in-house catering. Yeah, you did. You were you were you supplied all the the uh, luncheons and everything else that went on. And over the top of here, the runway. That's now the golf course. Um, so the runway has been turned into a golf course. We've got nine holes here. Um, and unfortunately, the poor old alpacas that you used to meet, um, yeah. they're down, they're down the bottom. And that's Barry and Gary. If you can see them down the bottom of the field yeah. there. Now they're in a bit of jeopardy because two of the holes we have to go over the top of. Uh, Barry and Gary, the alpacas, and so they uh, they hide in the corners when they see the golf clubs coming out. <laughs> in here is Michelle's office, and if you can see through, the, I don't know if it's open actually, but she's got a sewing machine in there, and she's making masks, face masks for everyone up here at Top Farm. Oh, very good. Well done, Michelle. Good that very good of her, isn't it? Uh, hot well, it's tub. good that you've got Michelle there, really, for so many reasons. I know, absolutely. She's she's um, keeping things keeping things uh, on a level key, I guess you'd probably say. Yeah, and and if we go out the front, is the other side of the golf course over here. Oh, hang on, a bit, bit more memorabilia. How about that? The parish family tree. I don't know if you can see that. Most of my ancestors were all castrators, um, which is <laughs> a bit concerning. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the wonderful, you've got one of those, these pictures, I'm sure. We got them from um, Rowan, I think. It's a ba fantastic picture, as you can see, with uh, Valentino and Jorge and Simon Shelley, uh, Stoner, uh, all signed, which I think was uh, when we uh, retired from doing the BBC, that came from. I haven't uh, got one of those, because I'd finished before then. Oh, right, remember. yes, of course, you did, yeah. The wonderful oh, uh, Val Valentino paintings. Uh, Valentina Rossi. Um, this house is full of Rossi, Lorenzo and uh, Barry Sheen, of course. Now, I'm just going to take you out the back, well, the front, I guess. And there's the other side of the, the field from the alpacas. And that's the other two holes over there for the golf course. So in fairness, things have been quite good for me. I'm very lucky to live in the countryside with my lovely wife. Well, you are. It's a beautiful spot out of there. The Geordie Lodger wants to know if that was the house that Jeremy Beadle came and tried to blow up, but that was an old house, wasn't it? No, that wasn't. That was a previous house, uh, which was at another farm, yeah. So that, Jeremy Beadle came and, and got me properly there. There was a consortium of horrible people that decided that uh, I needed getting. I'm going to put myself back on there. Um, and they did. They came and made a NATO exercise 
at my workshops, and that was way back in 1987 when I was running the Lockhart Yamaha team. And Yamaha, yeah, called, 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 Yamaha that's right, Yamaha it? called Keith Hewitt. Yeah, was my again last right. night. So, sorry, there's a slight delay. Um, and I felt like you knew that it was a Beadle thing halfway through because you were so calm. Yeah, th th there's a good reason why I was so calm. And there was a part of me that thought it was a joke until I saw the size and the scale of it. But the main reason I was quite calm is they'd all got guns. Right. Um, <laughs> they were holding machine guns and things like that. So I am very calm when machine guns and things are around at me, around me and, and lots of big burly soldiers that probably could have torn my head off. But I, initially I did think it was a joke. And then all of a sudden when the bombs and explosions went off and helicopters were flying around and anti-aircraft guns were going off, that was when I got quite concerned. And that, about halfway through it, I was properly thinking they were blowing up my workshops and I knew we had to get off to Mallory Park that weekend. <laughs> it was a proper good job though, wasn't it? They, they did it really well. Um, last night... Allegedly. I, I thought, was, yeah. Do you know, um, I thought last night, I better just check... You, I better just check on you because I, I, I know you so well, but I thought I'll just look on Wikipedia and just make sure I know everything about you. Um, but I'd forgotten about the toilet block in Finland incident. Yeah, that was, um, that was quite interesting as well. Got into a bit of trouble there. Uh, got away with it, but the police did sort of get involved a little bit. Um, and it wasn't my idea in fairness. So um, I was an accomplice to Mr. Sheen who had, worked out over the years he'd been racing in Finland. Unfortunately, there is no uh, racing goes. I think there's some classic racing goes up there, but it lost its status from the Grand Prix in about 19... sort of 81, I guess it was, something like that. But yeah, anyway, in, 19, hmm, in 1977, I was there for the first time, uh, did my race there. And in fact, uh, Barry Sheen clinched the World Championship there for his second World Championship. Um, and, and after the race meeting, and you have to remember back then, there was no garages and big complexes like there is nowadays because the paddock was actually the athletics track for the town of Imatra. So it was just a big area where everyone parked their vans and caravans and put their awnings and tents up and things like that. And then about five o'clock, there's a few celebrations about to take place because Barry had clinched the world championship. I think I finished fourth in the race. So it was all going to be a big, big night. And um, Barry said, oh, this toilet block here is absolutely disgusting. It can't cope with all the riders that were here and back then there was a 125 cc class 250 350 cc 500 so about five classes of about 40 competitors um all wanted to go to the toilet because we were all having to race around a very dodgy track which was very dangerous he said let's get rid of this toilet block i said yeah fine how are we going to do that he said well bring your jerry can full of avgas petrol highly inflammable petrol and he said it'd be easy he said uh, we'll just tip it around there set fire to it it'll all burn down because it's a big wooden toilet block anyway and that will be the end of it. Um, but what was quite interesting, when we got 50 metres from the toilet block, Barry said, right, I'll keep guard. Uh, you go off and tip the petrol everywhere, which I did, because if Barry Sheen tells you to tip petrol somewhere, you do. Uh, anyway, when we lit the sort of trail of fuel that I'd left across, we both realised we should have gone to our science classes a bit more because we'd forgotten about methane gas. The whole toilet block completely blew up. Um, and which was quite good in the fact that we got rid of it. But unfortunately, all the contents of the toilet of poo spread over the paddock as it blew up and landed on people's tents and awnings and everything else. So anyway, we got a new toilet block and I feel very proud that I've been part of the benefiting toilet blocks around the world. Yeah. <laughs> but the police did come, but they never caught us. <laughs> <laughs> I guess everybody was good. <laughs> Actually, I, you won't know this story because it was after we stopped working together. Um, three years ago, actually, I was at the Classic TT queuing up for a cup of coffee in a cafe um, near Jerby, somewhere on the Isle of Man for the Classic TT. And a little lady tapped me on the shoulder and said, you are Steve Parrish. I said, yes, that's right. She said, well, I am from Finland and my, 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 my husband... He was parking next to the old shit houses in Imatra. <laughs> so, excuse my language a little bit. Anyway, incredibly, this lady was there and witnessed it all. And the police came and they took her husband away for the night because he wouldn't say who would set fire to the toilet block. So what a star he was. Yeah. Absolutely. Quite incredible. Yeah, did, 40 years that. later. You, I you sort of needed that protection back in the day, though, didn't you? Because there was all sorts going on over the years. But before we get into any more antics, well, no, yeah. I mean, these, these go hand in hand. But 
when you, I mean, my, all, a lot of the questions that I've had sent in have, have obviously revolved around your relationship with Barry because mm. not only were you teammates, but I mean, you were best friends and for, for, forever actually and, until Barry sadly left. You were so close, weren't you? Yeah, we were partners in crime, I guess you could say. Um, I, he was my hero when I was growing up. He probably inspired me to go uh, motorcycle racing and probably uh, thousands of other people. And then, like people say, you should never meet your heroes. I did, and I got on really well with him. And we just gelled. He actually, at the time when we first met, he was living not far from here, me in Cambridgeshire. Um, and we just liked the same things, which was sort of... Um, motorbikes girls going fast doing crazy daft things um and i think probably back in the days when you could do some daft things and didn't get into as much trouble as you do now i don't think you're allowed to do daft things now are you? and it's it's quite sad i've been doing some stuff on twitter actually with rob mcelnay the rob mac memories it's been called and yeah. they've been really yeah. fun telling telling all the stories and rob rightly so he's sort of we've all come to retirement and he's passing it on to the youngsters but I'm not sure if they've got many tale, <laughs> tales to tell now because, um, I, I, you know, I'd love to be still racing if I wasn't as old as I am. But quite honestly, now it's so much more of a job, isn't it? It's sort of go to the gym, go to the dietitian, go to the racetrack, go to the press office. It is a proper job where back when we were doing it, we raced maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we had four days to just muck around and get into trouble and do daft things and lead a, a relatively normal life outside of that. And so it's a completely different world now. We literally did run around. It was called the Continental Circus, and that's what it was. It was a, a bunch of people traveling around the world, staying at the same campsites and going, doing this and go-karting and fishing and, you know, leading a normal life. So... I'm very pleased to say I've got some stories to tell and I'm not sure if the, the modern generation has as many. They've got plenty about the racetracks, but not much else. But you guys took it to the nth degree. I mean, you got away with so much and probably because you were cheeky chappies and good looking and, mm. and all that. But didn't you qualify once for, <laughs> for Barry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Can you, can you imagine that happening now? <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, you, you can't imagine that anything like that could take place. This was Mallory Park, actually, it was. And the story got mixed up a little bit because um, ja you remember Jamie Whittam and Carl Fogarty were going around doing uh, theatre shows and, and talking to people. Yeah. And, and it yeah. sort of got embellished a little bit, this story. And, and now I'm doing the theatre shows called The Mad Tour. Um, I, I tell this story and people go, are you sure you've got that right? Because Jamie Whittam said it happened this way. But trust me, it, Barry... James told the story where Barry was drunk one night and hung over and couldn't go out on the on the qualifying session. Well, it wasn't true, actually. He turned up at Mallory Park and his leg had got jammed up. And one of the screws had come loose in his knee where he'd had some work done on it after his operation from uh, the crash in Daytona when he fell off at 180 miles an hour. Anyway, they had to get him off to a, an osteopath to get his leg fixed up because his leg wouldn't straighten. They had to lift him off the bike. His leg wouldn't straighten after the free practice session. So Rex White, this was the team manager, came to me and I was his teammate and said, big, big um, ask here. Is there any way that you would go out and do a few laps on Barry's bike while he goes to the osteopath um, just so he can qualify? But we're going to sneak him out so no one at the racetrack knows he's gone out to the osteopath. So they put a blanket over him. Franco, his dad, drove him out in the back of the Rolls Royce, took him off. When the qualifying time comes around, I'm in his leathers, in his helmet, boots, gloves on the number seven bike. And I had to go out and do three or four laps. What was hilarious for me was every time I got to the hairpin, there was a whole bunch of girls waving underwear at me. <laughs> Little did they know there was a bloke with a big, big nose and big ears underneath Barry Sheen's helmet and they're waving their pants at me. But anyway, so I came in, did the three or four laps, parked the bike quickly in the awning, ran out the back, got changed, got on my bike, went out and I did probably 10 laps, changed a few things on the bike when Barry gets back, and again, there was no electronic timing. It was handwritten notes on the toilet block at Mallory Park, what the qualifying was, because there'd be ladies with stopwatches in the, uh, in the control tower doing the timing. There he comes, and we go and have a look, and sure enough, Barry Sheen, front row, Steve Parrish, row two. I managed to out-qualify myself. I mean, that has probably never, ever been done before. To this day, I don't know whether his bike was better than mine, or it was the underwear being waved at me, but something inspired <laughs> me that day. <laughs> well, yeah, you should have had that uh, at all of your races then, I think, really. Some, uh, I know, but unfortunately, people knew what I looked like, and, and I wasn't very sheen. But anyway, he couldn't believe it, I couldn't believe it. He went on to win the race, and I finished second. So that was okay, no real dramas. That was kind of how it all was.
Yeah. When but yeah. Think, when mm. you think back to Barry, um, what, what is it that you that you miss about him? I think having a playmate, a lot of it is is that. And and you know, I ha a lot of people say, oh, that bloody Steve Parish, all he did was he was in Barry Sheen's slipstream. And you're absolutely right. I was. He was. Uh, he was like a brother, a father, a good mate. He was. Uh, a very worldly person, very influential, opened lots of doors. He managed to help me get sponsorship. Um, and he was better than me. I put my hands up to it. You know, I mean, I was okay, but he was a proper world champion. Um, and I learned a great deal from him. And, and I did right up until, sadly, his demise of the terrible cancer that he got. And, and I couldn't believe that happened because uh, Barry was someone that fixed everything. Fixed it for me and himself and other friends that he had. Um, and he thought he could fix cancer. I think he genuinely did. He couldn't believe that he couldn't fix it himself. And, and he took the wrong kind of route, I guess you could say. It's one of the big mistakes he made in his life. We all make some, but that was a pretty major one. And I think, had he have chosen the operation, I don't know. Maybe it fixed him, maybe it wouldn't. But he'd had a fantastic life. He was 53 when he passed away. And he probably did more than most of us would do if we lived till we we're 100. So, um, and he wouldn't have liked being old. There's no question about it. And I do hope he's got me a good spot in the paddock and uh, a nice room at the hotel and some grid girls when I get there. I'm sure, well, I'm sure that's true. Um, I remember that time, obviously, it was um, etched in our memory for, mm. for the sad, saddest of reasons. And I think we made a call to him uh, on the BBC. We did, yeah. We remember that. And, mm. um, I remember because you and I really did, hadn't really got on that well, I think, prior to that. And mm. it was sort of the first time that I... I felt like I'd seen any emotion from you, um, any kind of, you know, uh, human emotion. Because you just joked all the time. You was constant, mm. you know. To me, you seemed like you were quite um, made of steel. And I saw the human side of you when, when all that was, was kicking off. And I just, and I saw you differently. And I think after then, you were different. Do you, do you think it changed you? Barriers. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Susie. I probably um, probably did change a bit, but that um, always joking, no emotion thing comes from racing in really dangerous times, I think. I think I became a much more hardened person. I think you had to be because it was not uncommon to lose a rider every Grand Prix you went to because the tracks were so dangerous, the protective clothing with war was crap. Um, the bikes used to seize up. You know, there was it was just the perfect storm to kill yourself and, and it was madness really but you were driven because you were so hungry for what you did and so I think that hardened me a lot because I did lose an awful lot of friends but I think when Barry went that the armor fell down it came down because if he could die then anyone you know what I mean anyone could because you always think we all think oh it's not going to be me it'll be someone else and I that's exactly how I led my life it'll never be me it'll be someone else touch wood at the moment that's the case it is but I do think that that really did put a big, big chink in the armour for me because the guy that I thought was indestructible got disrupted. And, and so, yeah, it changed me quite a bit. Um, but also, as you get older, you mellow, don't you? There's no question about it. You have children, you mellow, and you, you kind of get married and you meet people and, and your life becomes slightly different. Um, racers are different people. You have to be. You're that single-minded, focused person. And then all of a sudden, when you stop doing it and you grow a bit older, those kind of blinkers come off and there's another world to it. And for me, another world has kind of arrived. The demise of Barry made me think an awful lot about my whole life and the way I'd lived it. And I look back thinking what wonderful times we had. And we did, we really did have fantastic times, but we lost lots of mates doing so. So it was tragedy for lots of families and everything else. But boy, did we, sex, drugs and rock and roll. That was kind of how it was, but without the drugs. And I must just tell you, while it's sort of, and I'm trying to laugh a bit now, so I'm not too emotional. I interviewed Giacomo Agostini, who probably everyone in the motorcycle world knows. And uh, it was a big event at Mercedes-Benz World in uh, Brooklyn. And I said to Giacomo, I said, God, you lived in the fantastic time of the 60s and 70s before me. I said, it was proper sex, drugs and rock and roll. And he went really quiet for probably 30 seconds that felt like three minutes. And he looked up and he said, just the sex. <laughs> which I thought was, I thought was just wonderful, really. <laughs> oh, I think we, I think you might have dropped out, Steve. I'll just keep on having a little chat until you, uh, until you come back. Some great stories, obviously, coming from Steve. There's, there's loads more great stories. Um, always a pleasure to, to speak.
Oh, you're yes, back, you're back. back. Have you moved? Yeah, no, we're back. Okay, thank you. Um, I was, you were sort of leading me to, to ask you about, not, the, not a, yeah, yeah, another phase of your life then, post Barry. So the last kind mm. of um, 15 years. Have you enjoyed that as much as, as when you were younger? Have you been able to reset your brain and enjoy different parts of your life? Yeah, I have. Um, it is tough to, to adjust. And, and I see it in all people in sport, not just motorcycle racing. When you stop doing something that you're good at doing as a sport that I did, and you can make a good living out of it, and you meet lots of famous people, and you work with lots of famous people, and you're having an absolute ball, and then all of a sudden that comes to an end, sometimes through injury, uh, sometimes possibly through you losing your, your speed, your performance. Um, it, it does become difficult to make that transition because all of a sudden you don't get people patting you on the back you don't get adulation of saying well done you've done a great job so my change of life was obviously truck racing came up and and helped me through that period and then of course commentary work and working with you with you and all the other people uh i really enjoyed that time i think it gave me a purpose in life it gave me something to focus on i was still traveling the world covering motorcycle racing which was my love so I've been very fortunate. I've sort of jumped from one thing to another. And again, I, I must hark back to Barry Sheen, who said, Stavros, if you fell in a cesspit, you'd come up with a salmon on your head. And he's right, because I kind of have been that lucky person that's bounced from one thing to another. And we're all sat here now, aren't we, thinking, this is dreadful what's going on with coronavirus. It's awful. But I still feel I'm quite lucky because it's not affecting me as much as some people. Fortunately, I haven't got any health problems and I don't know anyone that has. But um i am a, a lucky person and, and I've, my life has changed quite dramatically I've got a lovely new wife now michelle who looks after me she thinks i don't don't like her that much but i do i love her dearly i'm his carer and she says she's my <laughs> carer <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah well you need one uh, so <laughs> i do the, oh, but yeah, we're, we're very lucky. Um, yeah. You, you've um you've been um also you've been You've been a doctor. Belinda Rogerson is watching this. She'll be uh, cringing right now. But you know, I've seen you, I've seen you aid people and be your own carer. Yes, I have. I, I, I need to be my own carer. Yeah. The, the, the doctor all started, as you would know, you're on the flight, wasn't it, with John Hopkins? Yeah. Um, I've been speaking to John recently, and he still has never got me that beer that he owes me for getting him on that flight. But. Um, yeah, Belinda wasn't very impressed with me that day when I, and I don't think anyone was really. They thought this time he's gone too far, and I probably did actually. But I was just trying to help a mate out. I always try to help people out, and and just to remind you, I'm sure you can remember it. It was actually I do remember even the flight number. It was BA zero zero seven that left Narita back to London. Yeah, that's how much I remember of it. And um, as we all know, uh, John Hopkins had crashed and broken a rib and a collarbone. I think. Caparossi knocked him off or something at the Japanese Grand Prix and they weren't going to let him fly were they because no. he'd got um, broken ribs and they were worried about pressure changes and everything else and collapsed lungs and things collapsed like that lungs wasn't it? and all these medical things that can happen to you and I'm sat next to well near you and Belinda and Charlie and everything else and Charlie was desperate to get back he'd got a meeting as he always did have um, and I wanted to get back and I could see this getting really bad because they were going to chuck Hoppo off and then get his luggage off and it was going to delay us for flipping hours so I decided that I should step in and announce that I was a doctor, which I thought they would just accept. And then they wanted me to sign this document. And had I got proof that I was a doctor, and I didn't have any proof, but as you well know, my business cards have got NLNAM on them, which stands for no letters after my name, because I've never got any, and PhD, because I did some pizza delivery. So it looked like I could have been a doctor. <laughs> They accepted it, and sure enough, we went. Anyway, off we went with me signing off as a doctor. And then, if you remember it, which made it even worse, I got a call to see the purser or the uh, whatever they were whatever they're called, in, cabin director, I think they're called now, because they got a problem at the back of the plane. Well, I did nearly shit myself at that point, I can tell you. Um, and I do remember Belinda saying, you can't do this, you work for BBC, and this, that, and the other. And I explained that I work for BBC Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and it was Monday, so it was my day. Anyway, I got, we got away with it again, and Hopkins didn't die. We all got home on time, and everyone should be quite happy about it. And fortunately, but, I should also say, the person that needed help at the back of the plane worked for Dorna, I seem to remember, so yeah. it was all okay. Mm -hmm. 
he was a cam well it wasn't really okay because he was drunk that was what it was about the, the problem was and i initially thinking oh my god it's someone having a baby or a heart attack and i'm gonna have to lock myself in the toilet so for... having a baby. Oh, <laughs> can you imagine, <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> me shouting for hot towels oh god <laughs> <laughs> but also for the baby, the first thing it would see when it came out would be you. It would be ruined for life. I know. It would be scarred for life, wouldn't it? And they'd have to call it Stavros. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was a guy, it was Manuel or someone, a Spanish cameraman from Dorna. And I'd been working with him about two weeks before and he was completely drunk and kept shouting, hey, Steve, and everything else. And I'm trying to make out, I don't know who the hell he is because I'm a doctor and uh, it was pretty much chaos. But anyway, it was all okay. And so I am now a qualified doctor. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're good with letters, aren't you? Because um, you once upset the local people in your village with letters on your car. Yeah, uh, well, not just me. Did you hear about Matt Roberts with it? That no. was even, oh, that was even funny. Yes, I, I, years ago, I decided I needed a private number plate and P-E-N-1-5 came up for sale and so I bought it. And some, it's a P-E-N-1-5. Now, some people think it's 1-S, but it isn't. It's 1-5. So it's their dirty minds that think it looks like penis. And then I bought 6-0-C-K, which is 6-0-C-K, which is nothing to do with cock, I guess you could say. But anyway, breakfast show. But some people do think it says nasty things. Or not nasty things, but whatever. But... What makes me, yeah, some of the neighbours got cross. And when I went to Germany, I got arrested in Hockenheim because they thought it said penis. And they said, do you know what this is meaning in Germany? And I said, probably the same as in England. Well, this is not right. And you would not be wearing this number plate if you knew what it meant in Germany. They kept on to me. Anyway, but when Matt was writing my book, the current one out, uh, the Parish Times, I stuck it on his car, on the back of his car. Yes, there it is. Um, he came down to stay with us for a weekend and we were writing and he was having uh, Michelle's delicious meals and everything else. And I put PN15 on the back of his car. He drove off up to where he lives in near Huddersfield, parked it outside the house. The neighbours all were seeing it. He didn't know it was even on there because he hadn't looked at the back of his car. His lovely wife, Jane, goes off to work at school in the car. <gasps> parks it in the school. <laughs> parks it in, in the school car park. <laughs> can you imagine that i think she got a good <laughs> a lot of credibility from all the kids at the school which <laughs> turned up with penis on the back of her car but anyway but again it made made me laugh a lot and i think they got away with it because i got the blame again which i oh, deserved I, I didn't know that story um mm, i regularly yeah. by the way used to get things coming through my front door at home that were um addressed to me with D different pregnancy things and yeah. STD yeah. clinic things that were all from <laughs> Steve. And yeah, uh, obviously, if Steve are. ever offered you a Ferrero Rocher was the, I think, speciality. Mm. You would it never, was. never no, ever take one of those. They look delicious, but you might find something in them that was quite chewy. Yeah, that's that's true. Well, it was chewy, but actually, bless him, Toby Moody bit one bit into one one day. But what about, were you on the flight to Le Mans when Matt was eating the Mealworms dipped in chocolate. Yes. No, I don't think you were on that that particular flight. How, you should have been because you've got a bronze. You had a gold card, didn't you, with Plummet Airways? I think that's expired now. But I know you're a gold card <laughs> member holder. Um, but Lucky we, we decided. Got a window seat on Plummet Airlines. That was always. You did, and you got to meet the captain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, there was lots of lots of uh, perks that went with a gold card on Plummet Airways. But uh, oh yeah, Michelle's just passed me. Look, that's um, I don't know if you can see that. That's. That's the uh, Plummet Airways gold card. There it is. I don't know if you've still got yours. But, well, I um, think but, you could extend it with the current circumstances because, you know, well, otherwise I've got to start all over again. I've had to furlough the staff. We're, um, we're looking for a government grant. Unfortunately, Michelle was the only member of staff and she's been furloughed now. So, <laughs> so uh, we're, we're, we're sort of sitting, waiting for a government handout to somehow keep Plummet going. But um, yeah, we, put, we made up a meal package one day and Matt loved them. They were uh, dried mealworms dipped in chocolate. <laughs> he was scoffing the lot of them. Anyway, when we arrived in Le Mans, he was cheaping well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember in Valencia, we all went out for dinner <clears throat> and yeah. Steve always had with him about his person a mouse on a string a set of Billy Bob tea and usually a fart machine have you got them there have you still got I'm them just there? having a look I'm, I'm just having a look um 
I did. Oh yeah, there's. Hang on. Yeah, I have. There's in the tray. There's there's the the mouse on a string. It's sort of retractable that comes flying across the table, as you well know. Yeah. Uh, and there's the Billy Bob teeth that as soon as I put them in, I start talking like Lord Fontenroy, and I can't help it. Um, and up here, there will be uh, a remote controlled fart machine. So, yeah, there's a number of these around the house, uh, mainly because I was the UK importer for them uh, for a number of years. I had a company called Parish Poo Poos, um, and so we imported fart machines. But, yeah, the, I'll never forget Valencia because I nearly died that night, didn't I? Hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you, you might have exaggerated and embellished slightly, but there was a, definitely a few dodgy moments. So we went out for dinner in um, in Valencia because we had the race, obviously. And uh, Steve was just basically up to his, his normal tricks. Um, I'll, I'll let you pick up the story. That's why you're on after all. Right. Um, yeah, it was. It was kind of end of season party, I think it was, wasn't it? And there must have been 14, 16 of us, uh, you know, all the crew, BBC crew. Um, and we found this lovely restaurant in Valencia and we were all having a lovely meal and it was all good and there's lots of banter and chatting and everything else. And behind me, sort of behind a pillar, was a couple sat at the table just for two on their own. Um, and, and it kind of now I sort of look back on it, I think it was probably going to be one of those proposal romantic evenings where they were kind of staring in e into each other's eyes. And, and had I realised that was going on, I maybe wouldn't have got involved so much. But I decided that things needed livening up a little bit, or they did for me. Um, so I flung the mouse through this like little hatch there was to this other table, which it landed on the, the lady's plate. Um, and she started to scream and then when it came flying back to me and shot across the table she screamed even more jumped back knocked her chair over the poor guy jumped up and was on the on another chair screaming all the waiters came running over they were looking at the ceiling because they thought it fell off the ceiling and all this kind of pandemonium was going on then I think they kind of clocked it was me or I was something to do with it because I was laughing so much and everyone else was laughing so much. I thought the good thing to do is to go off to the toilet. So I snuck off to the toilet very quietly as quick as I possibly could. And then maybe it was another wrong decision. As I came back down, I thought I'd disguise myself by wearing Billy Bobby teeth so he wouldn't recognise me. And I think at that point, you started to realise something wasn't going well because this bloke was now running around the restaurant chasing me with a steak knife because I'd ruined his romantic evening. Um, and I think you intercepted and tried to calm things down a little bit. And I, I remember at this point, I've got a chair now and I'm fending this bloke away with his steak knife trying to stab me, I think. And then you managed with your Spanish to calm things down a little bit. But I do remember, and I think it's one of the best quips I've ever heard from you, Susie. I'm not saying there hasn't been lots, but I was that night called Chairman Mouse. Yes. That was it. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I remember it. I remember it well. You were, you were standing there. You got the, you suddenly realised you were actually in trouble. He mm. was brandishing his steak knife and he was mm. really going for it. You picked mm. up your chair, you had it in front of you and you looked mm. at me and you went, mm. help me, you can speak Spanish. <laughs> That's right. Can you defuse this situation as quick as possible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. was, uh, that that mouse, was has got me into, mouse has got me into a few problems over the years. So it doesn't, it doesn't, in fairness, it doesn't come out quite as much as Michelle thinks I should grow out of it really yeah. uh, good luck with that michelle um matt <laughs> roberts is actually watching in my geordie lodges telling me that he's on he's uh, following the the story so matt if you've got any comments that you'd like to throw in then please feel free and the geordie lodger will pass them over to me but the um the fart machine steve was yeah. something that i had a sort of love hate thing because i hated i hate the idea of it i hate the, the stupid humor that goes with it but i can't help laughing and there has been so many times we've been sitting in airport lounges and I've just been beside myself because of the people that you've pranked. And the way that they react to it mm. is quite extraordinary. Mm. Mm. I know. Can you remember, again, it was in Japan, Frankie Keeley, I thought he was going to have a breakdown. Uh, it was Frankie Keeley and his wife in the, in the uh, BA lounge at the airport. And, and I'd got it there and he wanted to use it. And then he got, and, and the guy was just, rolling around in tears he really was but and we'd hide behind can you remember we'd hide behind newspapers sometimes you couldn't help but laugh could you and all of a sudden you'd see the flipping daily telegraph shaking because you were giggling and laughing so much and everything else um yeah there was an awful i remember in in germany one time they took the coffee machine apart they thought they thought the coffee machine was making strange noises um and you're right some people the reaction would be well 
they'd stare at other people, wouldn't they? It's obviously not me. What do you think you're at? Which old man? And it got confiscated once and they wouldn't give it you back. Was that in Germany? Uh, might have been German. That was when it was hidden in the cornflakes, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, it got confiscated. And, yeah, it did. Um, and I they hid were it not in the, happy. No, I hid it in the bottom of the, the whole, there's a big bowl of cornflakes that people should go to help themselves for breakfast. And I decided it'd be really good fun to hide it in the bottom of them. Um, and then when people went to get the cornflakes, this thing would go and go off. And you're right, the waiter came out and took it away and everything. And I, <laughs> I rushed over. Where is it? I rushed over and grabbed it quickly and made out it was in my inha my inhaler and I'm <laughs> and I'm breathing into it. It's like it's my inhaler, <laughs> so he wouldn't take it away. But I've lost loads of them over the years. It's caused so much embarrassment and pandemonium. I've decided it's best to leave it alone and, and not take it away. Um, I think, as I think is you've my had the best days. I do remember yeah. that the Japanese engineers used to react very strangely when they, because they would just be so embarrassed because they're mm, almost yeah. embarrassed because they thought yeah. it might have been themselves or something, but it was just it, yeah. very funny to watch. I've got yeah. some questions would... for you. Yeah, carry on. I think it might have answered a lot of these, actually. Um, Judith Piper, do you remember Judy used to work for Dorna? Yes, I do very much. In fact, um, Judith got involved in translating the Barry book into Germany, German oh, right. uh, language. Yeah, and, uh, and it got sold very well in Germany. But yes, I know Judith very well. Yeah. She says, what's the worst trick that you've played on a colleague? Well, um, probably Michelle. Uh, well, not the worst, but the funniest, maybe with the fart machine, do you think? Um, one of my other jobs um, as a responsible grown-up uh, expert in motorsport is I work as an expert witness for motor racing accidents, motorcycle accidents, and I end up in court now and again to give by a statement or to, to be a witness and um, to stand up there swearing on the Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but. And Michelle was with me on this particular occasion. It was Lancaster Crown Court. We'd flown in Plummet Airways back from the Isle of Man. That was why she was with me on the way home. And I've got the fart machine in Michelle's handbag. She doesn't know this, of course. And the court was only for the people involved with it. So the big gallery that you get up the back where all the people would sit for a big kind of crown court event was empty apart from Michelle, who was sat there reading a book. And as I stood in the witness box with probably about 15 people all down the bottom, including the judge and the clerks and the solicitors and the counsel and everything else, um, I hit the button. Well, this echoed so much and was so loud. This is enormous big fart came from up in where everyone was sitting, but there was only one person sat there and that happened to be Michelle. At which point she was so embarrassed, she got up and ran out of there, which they all thought poor girl had gone to the toilet, I think. But it, I mean, how, how I kept a, can you imagine I'm in the witness box and I had to keep a straight face and carry on as if nothing had happened as every single person turned around to look up there. That was one of my, my better ones, I guess you'd say, or it was quite a simple one and it didn't harm anyone apart from Michelle. I, can't, I just still can't believe that Michelle did finally marry you. Um, there's a, a couple of people on here that are asking who Matt Roberts is. I can't believe you don't know who the great Matt Roberts is. Uh, you're a sport presenter, used to present on the BBC with us, commentator, book writer, author, legend. He's a legend. Yes, so he is. Legend. He's also mentioned. The, 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 and hang on a second. As you can see, they think Cody's run to the airport of Indy 2008 needs to mention. Miss you guys. Who's, who's run to the airport in 2008? Cody. Cody's run to the airport at Indy 2008 needs to mention. Miss you guys. Oh. Kiss. Does that mean something to you, Steve? Ah, oh, um, yeah. When um, That was when Charlie went in his pyjamas, wasn't it? Is that the one he's talking about? I think it probably is. You remember in Indianapolis when it got cancelled? Was that 2008? It was, wasn't it? When the storms came in? Yeah. Co uh, does that say Coxie? Probably says Coxie. This is Cordy's. You must have misspelled this. It, it, anyway, yeah, Coxie. Charlie It'd be Cox. Cox. So Charlie It'd be Cox. Cox. I'll tell you this story. Yeah, well, if Belinda's watching, she will, Belinda knows a great deal about yes. this story. It was when the uh, storms came. You remember that the yes. race got cut short and they weren't of then sure. Of course, it was the great horse in pit lane story. With Nick yeah, Harris. you're in pit lane with all the things blowing around everywhere, and Charlie Cox, um, the the grumpy old 
funny guy that we know, um, had to catch a flight. He'd got an internal flight, if you remember, back to somewhere and back to somewhere else. And this flight went at five o'clock. He'd already arranged to a guy on a motorbike to take him to the airport. Um, anyway, the race initially got cancelled. And then they weren't sure if it was going to run and it wasn't going to run. So I'm up there filling in with Charlie as to what's going on because we had about half an hour to fill in and this and the other. You're in pit lane. Uh, Belinda's up with us and at this point Charlie looks at his watch and it's like four o'clock and he has to go to the airport so he leaves me completely high and dry and I'm trying to carry on as much as I can Belinda's arguing with Charlie that he can't leave but he is leaving at which point as I look over and it's teeming with rain and there's a bloke outside waiting for it Charlie is putting his pajamas on well <laughs> Oh, sorry, but because Charlie always carried his pajamas, British Airways, because they were free for a start. Um, so he got his first class British Airways. So, and I'm trying to concentrate on talking about things and talking to you as, and you're running up and down. The hoardings are blowing around everyone. No one knows what's going on. And I'm now starting to giggle because he's now putting his bloody BA pajamas on. And the reason he is, is because he, he's it's the only clothes he's got that not, he, ne he needs to keep some clothes dry. So he's putting pajamas on to get on a motorway. <laughs> to go and get a first class ticket. Can you imagine what they thought of checking when this drowned rat walks in there wearing BA first class pajamas and nothing else? I mean, it was hilarious. And Matt was up there because they sent Matt up to help me fill in, I think. And he couldn't talk because he was giggling so much as well. God, they were funny, funny days. Mm. Yeah, they were. We were actually, it was a proper hurricane, wasn't it? I mean, it was serious stuff yeah. that was going on, and we we're trying to fill the time. He's yeah. putting his pajamas yeah. on. Matt goes up to you. I'm running up and down yeah. the pit lane trying to not get blown yeah. away completely. Yeah. yeah, Craig, do you remember Japan, though? Do you remember we all went out in Japan and obviously just drank far too much, and Charlie really, really nailed it that night. And we yeah. came home, and we literally had about 45 minutes until we had to catch the bullet train it's quite complicated you had to get mm. the, we had to get a taxi to the bullet train and then the bullet train and it was all time very uh, it was quite tight the connections to get the flight yeah. yeah and uh belinda our producer who i'm sure is watching now she had to go um to bed earlier because she was just done with all of us because we were probably all doing her head in <laughs> as usual mm. uh we had a massive night we got back to the hotel all of us sort of bundling around um i, I think i possibly was the most sober of us i'm not quite sure mm. we had enough time to go to our rooms just grab our stuff clean our teeth freshen up a bit jump in the shower come back downstairs be ready to go so belinda's there i'm there you're there matt's there no, no charlie, charlie. Mm. Mm. yeah well, we had to go and bust get, his, get him out of his room can you remember yeah we rang him, we rang him no answer belinda's getting all frustrated because we got to run out of time to get the taxes booked the taxis waiting we got, you and i end up going up to his room breaking into his room because we've got a, a key mm -hmm. from reception to get in which mm -hmm. was quite hard i seem to remember mm -hmm. at the time because of the yeah. security yeah. we get in, and he just is all over the place he's in bed he'd, he'd lay on the bed and fall asleep which is the, mm -hmm. the schoolboy error isn't it so he gets him, he's all flustered, doesn't know what day it is, he's all over the place, his hair's everywhere. I mean, it was anyway, but let alone at this sort of stage. And he goes, oh, I'll come, I'm coming, I'm coming. So we went back downstairs, and then two minutes later, the lift doors open, whereupon he walks out <laughs> with his suitcase, and the whole thing just falls out on the floor, and there's yeah, just yeah, stuff yeah. and pants everywhere. And we're just putting everything back in and trying to find his ticket, and oh, it's just mayhem. Yeah. Anyway, we get yes. on the bullet train, and who was it that climbed into the luggage rack? Well, I did initially, but then Charlie decided that was the best place for him to sleep, didn't he? And he gets up in there and literally fell asleep in that rack like I have on train. And bullet train racks are a little bit bigger than they are in the, the turn of ones here. But um, he gets up there and literally promptly falls asleep where the guard comes along, doesn't he? And, and I don't know how many listeners and watchers have been to Japan, but they do not like things happening that are not normal, do they? They kind of, they freak out a little bit, especially when there's a, an old bloke dribbling and snorting and farting, laying in a luggage rack um, and just doesn't, that, you know, he just, it was, it, they couldn't comprehend it, could they? And we're trying to explain to him that he's not that, well. Oh, and everything oh. Yeah. <sighs> Oh, not possible, oh. not possible. Yeah. And we were like, yeah. oh. <laughs> to be fair, I think we represented mm. the BBC very well in those days. I don't think we let them down at any point, do you? We're talking of Charlie and his luggage. What about that bag of his? 
He had a Brownie. favorite bag, Brownie the favorite bag. Yeah, that. Uh, considering Charlie wasn't didn't mean to make people laugh, he did a lot, didn't he? Because he he had this old crappy bag that he got from Gas Jeans, I think it was. That he, all freebies, weren't they? He looked everything was freebie, Charlie. yeah. And he treasured this bloody horrible brown scabby bag that was all frayed and knackered, and the catches didn't work and everything else. And it was disgusting. We were embarrassed walking around with him, and then we just. <laughs> Uh, we decided to remember tie it on the back of the car and drag it all the way back to the hotel one night. And yeah, he was traumatized actually. He didn't talk to me for two days. Well, mm. the thing was, when he used to go in the lounge, he used to get all the biscuits and stuff like that and put them in for snacks while he was commentating and peanuts. And and you used to say to me, I'm sure there's mice living in there because of the things that have opened and it hasn't been cleaned out for years. And we'd yeah. all had this bag, but ours had given the ghost, you know, years before. And Charlie still mm. got his, and it was his birthday. Do you yeah. remember, we bought him a new bag, because he got That's really right, he did. things. Mm. So we bought him this mm. beautiful um, Swiss Army knife, you know, style That's right, all yeah. bag and everything. We thought, great. Anyway, he, he said he was going to put Brownie in the bin. This was at Aston, wasn't it? And, it um, was, yeah. And he, and he just, he did put it in the bin, but then he mm. went and got it back out again. And, right, yeah. and you found it and you tied it to the back of the car. And yeah. of course, everybody that was driving past us was beeping because they thought that the bag had fallen out the back of the car. And we couldn't stop laughing. And at one point, uh, we realised what was going on. And he was very angry with both of us. Yeah, he was. He wasn't, he wasn't very happy with that, was he? Oh, my. Uh, no, how about, um, on, I was going to apologise to you when we nearly knocked you out in Laguna Seca trying to drive. Oh, actually, Belinda's listening. Better not tell her about this. If she is this, and when we tried to cut, <laughs> we tried to cut across to another road. We saw someone doing a big four before, and then we tried to hit a tree stump, and you flew over from the back seat and landed up in the front. Mm. I must commend you. Out of all the passengers I've ever ever had, you are the calmest lady I've ever had in the car. I never really complained, whereas most other people scream and shout. So thank you for that. Oh, that's a pleasure. Uh, the, one mm. of my overwhelming memories, really, of you, uh, good memories, is that we would always get to work on time because when you're going into a Grand Prix, obviously there's loads of traffic. Even if you've got a pass, there's always, it's always quite difficult to get mm. in. And with Steve, he would always find a completely illegal way. And I don't condone this. So do not do this, obviously. But we would get to work on time because he would take the road that you weren't supposed to take or the lane that you weren't supposed to take. And we would sometimes have a flashing blue light and we would get in to work on mm. time. Uh, yeah, they, they were good days, actually, weren't they? Yeah, that was because um, Charlie often talks about it. it was at Imola, uh, not Imola, big part, Monza. No, Monza, when we went through the park. That was it. Yeah, we ended up driving through the park to get to Monza. Um, and there was people having picnics and they got all their, their breakfast out and everything else. And we managed to drive all the way through the middle of the park and get straight away in there. But it's one of Charlie's favourite stories. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are. Um, mm. Uh, you have answered most of the questions that I wrote down from last night, but one of them from Ian Rigsby says, what's your favourite moment during MotoGP? And let's do your favourite commentating moment and your favourite racing moment. Favourite moment. Um, there was... Um, were, you at, were you at um, Imola when I put the... Uh, I think it was World Superbikes when I put the fish, Charlie Cox hated fish. Um, and he turned around to get something out of his bag and I put a fish um, skeleton in front of him and he then walked out the commentary booth and this and the other. That, I, I think you were at that, that one on the occasion. Probably the favourite race, I have to say, was he, going back again, we did World Superbikes for a year and it would have been Troy Bayliss and oh, Colin and Edwards. Colin. That race was probably, and it was... Not was it only a great race, it was for the World Championship and, and uh, 2000, wasn't it? And it was just stunning. 2000 um, and uh, two. No, sorry, no. Two, three? Two, uh, th three. two was it? Three. Two, I don't know, two or three, I'm not very good with years, but it would have been around that time. Yeah, it was Colin and Troy for the World Championship. They got there pretty much on even points for the final round of the Championship. And it was just nip and tuck and Colin would be in front and then Troy would be in front and then they'd run into each other. And then it was just absolutely stunning. And as we all know, Colin went on to win that world championship. Uh, but it was right down to the last lap. And yeah, it was just quite extraordinary. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. And they've had a couple of British championship races like that. BSB races where it's been nip and tuck like that. But for a world championship to be decided with whoever runs whoever off the track, and it happened on two or three occasions. So that's probably my favourite commentary point. I mean, there's been some wonderful ones. I think um, 
uh, you'd have to say Barcelona with Seta Gibbonau and Valentino and, and certain events like that. I mean, I don't think I've ever really come across a bad race because there's always been something integral in the race that's been stunning. Um, and apart from that, funniest one, uh, what would that be? Has, has there been any embarrassing moments that I've got into? Um, I don't think we were allowed to, were we? We did get people in our ears on occasions telling well, us to shut up and we move did away work from the BBC, you know, and there were sort of, mm. you know, between one and two million people watching. So I think we were kept in line when we were actually working. Uh, yeah. I do remember yeah. a particularly funny moment, and this one is especially for Tracy Pinder, who was producing this piece at Donington Park, mm. where you and Charlie, uh, we thought it would be a good feature, if you went round Donington Park and took Charlie in the sidecar. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember that. And Tracy will giggle at this if, she, if she's, she's listening. Watching it, she's listening. Is because, yeah, you're right. We dressed up as people from when Donington Park opened up in about 1954 or something like that. And uh, in period gear, they got all the gear for us wear with leather helmets and goggles and everything else. And Charlie turned up late. We we're all ready to film this piece. So we put this gear on him. And he, Charlie was, well, he always turned up pretty grumpy, didn't he? It, it took a little while to lighten him up and everything else. So off we go to do two or three laps filming this all around Donington Park. And every time we got to a right-hand corner. I was lifting him up in the air. I was getting the sidecar right up in the air with a wheel up in the air. He was screaming and shouting at me, effing and blinding and was not at all happy about this. And we came around the last corner and I had him really high and everything else. As we came into the pit lane, perfect words. Tracy Pinder, who was trying to film me, said, Charlie, would you mind looking like you're a bit grumpy? Well, he looked like he was about to tear my head off, I tell you. He was not at all happy with it and everything else. Anyway, I thought it was really, really funny, and I think it went out really funny. But, hang on, you just reminded me, the funniest thing surely has to be the bus at Donington, because it was going to get... It was going to get scrapped, wasn't it? And you said, no, it's got to go in there. And we had a load of people going around Donington in a bus that I was driving for uh, Riders for Health charity. Um, right. And all these people leaning from left to right and everything else. And uh, that was where bus racing, my opinion of bus racing, kind of kicked off. But that went wrong. And I got into a load of trouble again because as I was driving the bus around flat out as fast as I could go, um, all the toilets overflowed and they had to pressure wash the track, the track that night. And Paul Butler, the race director, and I think it was Stuart Higgs and one or two of the others, couldn't work out what all the fluid was around on around the circuit and they're going around putting their fingers in it and going well that's not diesel and it's not petrol and they couldn't work out what it was and it was all poo and pee and j fluid mm. so i did get into big trouble from that you were in trouble because the insurance said that you could only drive at a certain speed and uh, belinda right, was yeah. back in going mad again because you've gone say the speed limit which obviously made the piece funny but it was yeah. our opener i think or part of the opener for, for our British Grand Prix. Yeah, and then uh, then Belinda got a phone call from the boss of National Express saying how irresponsible it was and everything else. So, there we are. She Never mind. I apologise. So that I've harmed. I apologise. <laughs> um, I've uh, got something else popped into my head now. There's just so many moments, isn't there? So, mm. oh, you, you know what you didn't do? Your racing moment, your favourite actual, because we've hardly talked about when you used to race, because all these hilarious things and mm. Barry and it all gets overtaken. But you were so, you were an accomplished racer, even though you played down. Mm. You did a mm. lot of TT races. You were British champion. You obviously rode top flight uh, motor Grand Prix, as it's called now, 500s. Mm. Um, so, favourite racing moments for you, where you, where you oh, felt really um, good? Yeah, so many. But one that, one that sticks in my mind, I guess... Um, would have been my first year doing Grand Prix. It was at Spa, which unfortunately um, bikes don't go to anymore. Um, and it, the, the most amazing track, the old Spa, I mean, they've modified it now, but in 77, I think they modified it in about 80, no, 79 or something like that. But it was a long circuit, it's about nine, 10 miles long. Um, and, it, and I'm just living the dream. My first year riding for factory team Suzuki, teammate Barry Sheen, Pat Hennam. Um, and I'm walking through the paddock. And I'm seeing all these people I've looked at over the years, and particularly people like Phil Reed, Giacomo Agostini, and all these famous, famous names. And nobody has a clue who I am, because it's my first year doing Grand Prix. I'd won the British Championship the year before. And it was one of those circuits where you did a lot of slipstreaming, and it'd be, you'd get in someone's slipstream, you'd pass them, they'd pass you, because the straights were so long. And I got in this titanic battle with Giacomo Agostini, 15 times world champion, poster boy, my hero again a bit like Barry and I'm 
slipstreaming him and I go past him. He slipstreams me and goes past me. And every time he's coming past me and the slipstreaming as you go past isn't that fast. You've got time to look across. So I'm looking across going, I can't believe this. I'm in a race with my hero, Giacomo Agostini, and I'm just passing him and he's passing. He was looking across with his blank face going, who the hell is that? You know, because it's my, <laughs> my first ever year. And you know, that, that that's the great thing about being a sports person. If you can achieve levels that you didn't expect, it's all these wonderful memories that, that go on, I guess you'd say. My worst yeah. memory would have to be falling off, leading the British Grand Prix, had I not have fell off with one lap to go, I'd be the only British person that had won the British Grand Prix because no one else has ever done it. No British rider has won the premier class of, of that. And um, yeah, I was leading it with a three and a half second lead, started the last lap. Barry Sheen puts my pit board out that was then in those days done by chalk, not with big letters. You had a, like a chalk board and you wrote on it with chalk. His bike had broken down. So he'd nicked the pit board off of my girlfriend, Linda, puts it out for me to start the last lap, which was a, chewing i was going to walk the race it was done and it started drizzling a little bit around the back and excuse my language again he puts the pit board out that says gas it wanker um and i went past the pit board and fell off um so, so that was probably my worst moment i could have been famous had i finished that race um but yeah there's just i think being involved and and meeting like-minded people racing against people you can't you can never, ever do anything in life that is as exciting as racing Grand Prix motorcycles. I don't care. I've driven a Formula One car, I've raced trucks, I've flown aeroplanes, I've done aerobatics. Nothing, nothing is exciting as riding a Grand Prix motorcycle because that knife edge is so sharp. Uh, that's interesting that you said that. Uh, a lot of people asking about the transatlantic time. Did you enjoy uh, those races? Yeah, again, same thing, meeting all these wonderful people, Americans coming over. Um, and, and again, those boys knew how to party. They taught me how to party, actually. Gary Nixon and Dave Aldana and people like that. Um, that was another overriding memory. My, I did the Transatlantic Trophy as a privateer in 76. And I'm driving my own truck and my own caravan up the M1 from Mallory Park. It used to be on the, it would be Brands Hatch on the Easter Friday, Mallory Sunday. Alton Park Monday and on the Sunday night I'm driving up to Alton Park in my transit van or whatever and this great big long limo comes past like the Queen would be in you know those big long stretched Daimler things and it, as it goes past me David Aldana's bare ass is sticking out the window and I mean it just cracked me can you imagine all these people driving sedately up the M1 and this limo is going past with all the Americans with their bums hanging out the window and things like that. Yeah, a lot of fun, great races, big crowds of people. And it was a real team spirit, which is unusual for motorcycle racing, of course. It's, you know, apart from endurance racing, it's very individual motorcycle racing. So being in a team with a bunch of like-minded guys was good, good fun. Obviously, you know, a lot of people are sort of listening to you reminiscing about the older days and some days that weren't that long ago really where life was quite different in sport um and saying do you think it will ever go back there do you think the characters will ever go but i do think we have characters in in bike sport across all of the paddocks whether it's british superbikes world superbikes uh motor grand prix i do think that they we do have big characters and they shine through but it, it isn't the same obviously as it was back in the day um and it, it can't really go back, can it? Because of the pressures of sponsors and money and stuff. What, what, where do you sit with that? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, it is so commercialised now. And you're right, we do have characters, but I'm not sure if everyone knows what you know. You're on the inside, so you get to see people behind the scenes a little bit. And that's when you come across characters. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think Jorge Lorenzo is a great character, but you never know it from what you see on TV. Are oh, you going to have proper characters? This is My opinion is... Most sports people, um, and that doesn't just mean motorcycle racing, it means golf, it means football, it means rugby, it means tennis, come from the age of what, six, seven years old? If you're not playing a competitive at seven years old and riding a motorbike, at that point, you go to some kind of an academy. You are then taken out of what I call the real world. You're, you're filtered and channeled down this special avenue so I don't know if you can be what I call a proper character. You're never going to get a shag behind the bus shelter, are you, at school and that type of thing, because you, you're, you're removed from all that. And so I'm not sure if sports people can ever go back to being 
what they used to be. There's certainly people out there with great minds and, and, and they're fun people, but they don't live what I call a normal life. And I think you probably have to, to be able to be a character, to relate to normal people. That's just how I see it. Um, and, and it's unfortunate that you can't, or the, the sports person can't portray it because of, as you said, commercialism that goes on, their sponsors are not happy with this. And oh, the dietitian said they shouldn't have done that. And the psychiatrist said you shouldn't be doing this. So I don't know, I don't think you'll ever, but in my mind, Valentino Rossi's probably been one of the last, what I call a relatively normal guy, because he kind of was brought up through the paddocks and just did all the dull things. He modelled himself on the likes of Barry Sheen and people like that. Yeah, yeah, quite. And I, I guess, um, I mean, Valentino's a huge character, as we know, but um, I suppose it does, you're saying it like that, it does come from Charles when you start pushing boundaries mm. and, you know, like you mm. say, having a quick cigarette behind the bike shed or whatever, a bit of how's your father. Oh, that's an old fashioned term. Did you have, <laughs> let me just ask the Geordie Lodger. Did you have any how's your father behind the bike shed? Many times. Did you? Yes. Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. all these Are you saying you didn't? Oh, yeah. I was always having a snog somewhere at school with somebody. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, but I, I'm sure that does that does still go on you can still do things but um like blowing up toilet blocks and things like that you don't hear those kind of well, stories but, but it wasn't like everyone was doing that either by the way i mean you and barry were quite special characters i think in the paddock you must have been the biggest characters at the time yeah probably difficult to know because when you say it's diff it's hard to do things now isn't it because everyone's got a phone everyone's got a camera yeah we've all got Gosh. internets and, and you know it gets spread around if you you know if you had a fart now someone would put it on twitter wouldn't they so quite honestly it's very difficult to to hide anything you're going to do and you ha i have to say back in my day there'd be four or five journalists gunter Wiesinger would be one of them perhaps and john brown from mcn and there'd be about six or seven of them around the around the paddock and if you said, oh, keep that to, to yourself, that's not to go in the paper, it wouldn't. And that's how it was, which isn't the case anymore now. So um, that, that's where it's got much harder for people to, to muck around. Um, but yeah, we probably were. There was a few other good characters around. There was a lad called Philip Coulon that I remember was a good giggle and everything else. I must just tell you, I don't know if you know this story, a very quick one about Jorge, which is why I like him so much. I got Jorge with a fart machine at the, at the NEC Motorcycle Live uh, 2013, I think it was, uh, when he was the guest, he came over. Uh, it was early. He, loved, he loves this story. Maybe 2010. And he was sat in the green room waiting to come up on the stage where I was going to be interviewing him and hosting things and everything else. And he was quite shy back then. And he'd got two girls from Black Horse or someone, I don't know, wearing their lycra and ushering him around. And they were his sort of guardians for the day. And he was a little bit shy. And I put the fart machine under his chair and it went off. And the girls looked at him and he was hugely embarrassed. And I, I don't know where it came from. At the end of that day, he comes back with the Barry Sheen book that I wrote with Nick and he wants me to sign it. He got the book and he said, would you mind signing this? And I'm absolutely thrilled that Jorge Lorenzo, Jorge Lorenzo wants me to sign a book. So he passed it over and he said, and gives me the pen, gives me a pen. And it's got a flipping electric shock in it. It's only been and bought one of these pens that gives you an electric shock. I press it, <laughs> drop the book and the pen and everything else. So don't ever tell me that Jorge Lorenzo is boring. I would never. I love Jorge, as you know. I mean, I, I'm, um, I'm a big fan of Jorge's and um, he's supposed to be coming and doing this, but trying to pin him down is, is something else. But no, he's, yeah. he's, he's, um, he's interesting and brilliant. And I, I'm mm. desperate to see him back riding a bike full time. And um, hopefully I am as well. But hopefully, I mean, that's the difficult thing again and 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 i know it because i went through it you never know if you've lost it until you it's a weird thing and i just hope he hasn't because he's had some terrible times he it, you can't take anyone's skill and ability away but you can sometimes take their motivation away and i hope it'd be lovely to see him come back because he was such a star of yeah. the track but it's scary it really is scary for any rider year by year particularly as you get older you're worried about a injuring yourself and b mentally having that fire in your belly that makes you want to go out there and do what you do so um i wouldn't want to see him stop kind of the way he has if you know what i mean no, well, it'd be fascinating to see what happens there. He just turned 33. Yesterday was his birthday, actually, May the, mm. May the 4th. And yeah. um, he, he did seem really excited to be doing a few wild cards this year. But let's, let's see, because obviously mm. he has had some horrendous injuries. Um, mm. The Georgie Lodge mm. is holding up a piece of paper that says, can you tell the Bob Slate story? And then perhaps we should call that one. Is that, is that a fitting final story, do you think, Steve? 
Oh, I would have said so. Um, it was, uh, there's nothing very rude about it at all. We go back a long, long way, end of 76. I had a phone call from a very good friend of mine who tragically got killed at Brands Hatch called Piers Weld Forrester. Now, Piers was the Marquis of Ormond's great grandson, something like 23rd in line for the throne, used to date Princess Anne and so on and so on, lived in a big house in Waterford Road in Chelsea. I got to know him through Barry. He would introduce us to all the pretty girls in London and all the clubs and everything else. And I'd try, along with Barry, to teach him to ride his motorbike because that was his passion. So he bought a race bike and he went, came to the tracks. And so it was a great contra deal. We'd go to London, have a big time, and he'd come to the racetracks and have a good time. So, but the thing about Piers, even though he was an aristocrat, he had this great big house, he never had any cash. It was all in trust. So he's a kind of a bit of a trust affarian. And he was always scamming. He was a good scammer, he taught me a lot. <clears throat> but he knew. Prince Michael of Kent, who was the team captain of the British bobsleigh team. And he convinced Prince Michael of Kent that Steve Parrish, who was the current British motorcycle champion, was a fantastic bobslayer. Now, the reason he did, because if I was a good bobslayer, we got a two week paid for holiday in Austria, in Eagles in Austria, in the training camp for the nine, would have been the 1980 Winter Olympics. And he's convinced Prince Michael of Kent and told me, all I've got to do is go down to Austria with him and have a bit of fun on a bobsleigh. Well, I thought it was like one of those kids things that you'd use at the park. Had no idea I am now part of the British bobsleigh team until we get down there. I'd never seen one until that day. We're sent off with all the other competitors and there was the army, the navy, the marines, you name it, everyone from the forces in the British team. There was the French team, the German team, the Austrian team, the American, everybody was there. It was a big event for the Olympics. And I'm about to set off down this hill with Piers as my brake man two-man bob, I'm driving it. Never seen one before. Anyway, inevitably, we turned upside down on turn three, careered all the way down there. And the big no-no is if you turn upside down, the brake man should climb out the back because they've got big handles allow you to do so. Take the driver, which was me by the scruff of the neck, let the bob go on its own because it rights itself and then doesn't ruin all the ice. Well, turn three, we're upside down, but Piers is drunk because he wouldn't get in till he was drunk, <laughs> won't get out the back. That night, we finished, we went over the finishing line at 69 miles an hour, having gone through 14 corners upside down with Piers giggling. Happened the second night, we did make turn five. Eventually, you know, we got expelled. So it was another expulsion in my <laughs> career. Uh, and I bumped into Prince Michael at the Goodwood about three years ago, and he said, oh, yes, Parrish, I do remember you. But I was used to it because I got a spell from primary school, senior school, and British bobsleigh team, so it didn't really bother me. And we went skiing. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, just, just finally to finish that story, yes. that, that same year, 77, having been thrown out the British bobsleigh team, Prince Michael of Kent only turns up at the TT where I'm riding as an honorary president of the ACU. And he's, <laughs> I'm there on my 500 Yamaha, crapping myself in the toilet four times, waiting for the, the start of the TT. And it's got damp patches on the mountain and mist and you know, all the things that really spook you. And he wanders up to me, Prince Michael, with uh, the head of the ACU and the governor of the Isle of Man. And he looks into my eyes and he says, Parish, I do hope you're better at this than bobsleighing. <laughs> And indeed you were. You were much better. Uh, yeah. I'm going to have to expel you now from the Breakfast Club. Um, okay. It's been uh, joyous. I knew it would be. And um, I'm sure we haven't even got to t tip of the iceberg with all these tales. And perhaps, mm. depending on how lockdown goes, you'll have to pop back. And uh, a lot of people have really enjoyed this morning. So uh, thank you. What have you got left today to do? What have you got in store with Michelle? Um... I'm actually um, not doing an awful lot, but I'm playing golf later on. We play golf every day. I play with Michelle at four o'clock every afternoon. She's not beaten me yet, and I hope she doesn't. Um, and um, our sort of communal neighbours, who are my next door neighbours, we're a communion up here. So we have a, a game of golf on our course here that uh, we hope that no aeroplanes land on the runway because we'll or get run over. Like if the they old do. Exactly. Yeah, the alpacas. I'm going to get them crash helmets, actually. I think I might get a couple of alpaca crash helmets so that uh, we can do that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just before, actually, you go, what we, we do ask people if, they, if they're if they up for it. Um, have you got any bikes there? I don't know what you've got there. I can't remember. Yeah, I've got three 500RG 500s. I've got an FZ750. Yeah, have quite a lot. I've got, I even got a... You want to have a look at them? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, well, no problem. You might have to change it to um, um, follow me. Um, I've even I, I won't find that because it's in a in another shed, but I've even bought a motorbike and sidecar just because I can replicate taking Coxy for a ride on it. But um, Michelle, oh. Michelle has to be Charlie on the sidecar now. I'll let, I'll let, as you wander, um, do you think you could tell us the story about some of your other vehicles that you've owned? Because obviously, I know you've owned uh, an ambulance yeah. over the years. You've owned, uh, you need to change Hang on a minute, around. I might have to change you to four. Are you still there? Oh, yeah, you yeah. we might be cutting out. I'm not You're, sure. Oh, sorry. I've got you back again now. Right. Okay. Um, uh, believe it or not, this, can you see, this is the gym. There's gymna the gymnasium equipment in here. Um, okay. And, and um, under here, uh, there's one of the, uh, where are we? Where am I seeing you? Uh, I'm not good at this, am I? Oh, there you go. There's an That's R all right. RG it's live. Yeah, there you are. There's an RG500 there. Um, there's another one, all in te Texaco Heron. Colours. Uh, let's see that. I'll put the light on. Can you give us a bit of detail on the years and stuff, please. A bit of detail. Yeah, this this one here is the 1979 bike uh, that I would have ridden for Texaco Heron Suzuki. Uh, my assistant might undo that one here. I'll get uh, Michelle is here. This this is the one that uh, I would have ridden in 1977 that I could have won the maybe the British Grand Prix on. Oh, that's wow. under, a, under a cover there. Um, so that's there. A few sets of leathers that are, are up here. Um, but yeah, uh, another nice little little Honda 50 over here. Oh, my assistant's going to uncover that one. Are you impressed with the gym equipment? I'm, I'm actually impressed with this room completely. It's full of gold and we weren't even going to get a look at it. It's incredible. It's a perfect oh, right. no, pancake. Uh, you've got Keith Ewan up on the wall over there. Oh, let's have um, a look. Let's have a close look at Keith Ewan. There's Keith Ewan there, locked like Yamaha when I was running the team there. Uh, I'll tell you who else I've got over here. Look at this. You'll remember this bloke coming up. Can you see Lee Diffie? Oh, he rang me on my birthday, actually. Did he? Oh, he's a lovely man. I like Lee Diffie. He, he's there with Barry Sheen. Uh, who have we got over here? We so Lee, um, got... like oh, look, Neil, Neil Hodgson, yeah. Neil Hodgson, uh, winning his first World Superbike race at Donington Park. Um, Vic Reeve, when I did a feature with him on Barry Sheen. Um, Kevin Schwantz, yeah, a whole load of gear in here actually, bits and pieces. Uh, my son Joe, when he was very young. My oh, daughter... do you remember when Joe was young and he was fifteen and we were at Wimbledon? Because we all oh. love a bit of tennis, don't we? They thought, we they thought he was your boyfriend, didn't they? I know. Mm. I got cut up on the feed. I was sitting right front row, great seats. And the commentator went, oh, there's Susie Perry, our, our motorcycle presenter uh, with her boyfriend. <laughs> I was like, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you definitely, yeah, definitely pulled a young one there, hadn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, illegal. Yeah, yeah, illegal. And then there's a few track racing bits of memorabilia and stuff around here. Um, and then we've got another, well, I've got two or three sheds here with bits and pieces of tractors and sidecars. Uh, another bike in here, which is a Yamaha, my super stock FZ750. I'm I've been working on some of these phone. bikes. Hang on a second. I'm just doing a bit of a tech flip round because I normally have my phone the other way around for better camera, but my... I can't see you and I need to be able to see you. And the Geordie Lodge is trying to do it so so that it doesn't see him because he's a, there we go. Perfect. I've lost your audio, I think, Steve. All right. Okay. No, oh, there I'm you are. Now I've got you back. I've got, got, got me back. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a few um, bits and pieces of stuff around here that I've been working on over the period. What else do you do? I've got my snap-on toolbox out and I'm mending motorbikes and things. Um, we've got, like I say, another old Yamaha uh, just here. The old 750 Yamaha that used to race back in the latter years. Golf clubs ready for this afternoon. And it is such a splendid day here today, I have to say. Oh, there's one of the number plates, by the way. You... Let's have a look. Uh, uh, where's Michelle's phone? I can see where I'm pointing. Oh, at yeah, that. that one. Okay. <laughs> 
Mm. Michelle's yeah. got a normal one though, right? Yeah, she Michelle's got a normal one. Yeah, she she does. Uh, that's the reason I bought those number plates years ago was to stop my previous wife driving my cars around. Mm. <laughs> right. Well, I, it's yeah. now twenty five minutes past eleven. You, you've almost reached Carl Fogarty time, um, oh. which is which is an hour and a half. Uh, thank you, Steve, for your story. Uh, and that's a pleasure. Really good fun talking to uh, to you and reminiscing a bit. Uh, hi to Tracy Pinder and Belinda Rogerson, who uh, were part of the team back in the days. Yeah. And Matt, who's and Matt. somewhere around. Um, so, yeah, and Charlie won't be because he doesn't do things like this. But anyway, uh, we had a lot of fun and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of love. Thank you. A special thank you to Michelle as well for getting you on air and just for... Hello, darling, and um, and just well, keeping you alive, basically. But she's yeah. she's not Michelle. Uh, Michelle's not supposed to be on it because she's furloughed. <laughs> no, but you can't you can't do anything without showing Michelle, though, can you? <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> All right, you All guys, right. take care. Lots of love. Lovely to see you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. 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 Well, that was a Wednesday, not to be forgotten, wasn't it? Um, are you all right getting out? I hope. Yeah. You. There we go. Remove Steve Parrish, he's removed. That was fun. Did you enjoy that, Geordie Lodge? Awesome. Absolutely awesome. What a character. Yeah, great character. Yeah. You can't, even though he talks, obviously, a lot about Barry, I think it's hard to imagine those two together uh, up to their antics, unless you were there. And I know there's been a lot of people on here today that were there at that time, were great, heady days of motorcycle racing and sport that transcended motorsport back in the day, because, of course... That's what Barry Sheen did. He took motorcycling to a whole new level and suddenly everybody knew about bikes and uh, he had everything, didn't he? He was talented, good looking and he had the character to go with it and he's very much missed. So thanks for joining us today on The Breakfast Club. Uh, let you get on with your day now and uh, we hope you enjoy that. We hope that we lightened your lockdown. And tomorrow, what's happening tomorrow? It's Thursday tomorrow. The lovely Julia Bradbury will be uh, popping in for a quick chat. Uh, send me your messages, send me anything you want to talk about, and uh, we will send you our love from here in France. Just looking at something weird going on behind me, and <laughs> Steve oh. Parrish hasn't suddenly appeared, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. If we weren't trapped, that would have definitely happened. Anyway, my love and Georgie Lodge's love to you today. Uh, big kiss. Stay well, stay home, stay safe. <laughs>